Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Andrew. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'm so happy to be back in Thailand. I, I've been an attendee here uh, about four or five times in the past. And every year, such a great uh, conference. And I want to thank the Thai Golf Course Super and Tennis Association for their hard work and also for inviting me this year. I've been in Japan for 17 years. Um, first eight or so years, I was superintendent. And then I got over into uh, kind of a regional superintendent type role and then started doing some importing with uh, products and grasses and whatnot. And I, I was kind of getting going down the, the, a path that uh, I really didn't want to go to. I wanted to get back to where my passion was, growing grass. So I took a job at, I was fortunate to take the job at Kea Golf Club. And I've been there for five years. Um, Kea Golf Club has an annual tournament event and Zoysia Grass Green. So both of those were first for me. So there was a big learning curve in different areas, and I uh, hope to share those, those learning curves with you today. <clears throat> um, so before we get into tournament preparations, I would like to kind of give you a, a brief uh, introduction to golf into Japan, uh, the Japan Tour, and a little bit about Kea Golf Club. So, golf in Japan. There is about 2,194 golf courses in Japan. And Japan is not a big uh, country, so you can imagine that you can drive down the road and there'll be golf courses everywhere, right? <clears throat> um, On these golf courses, you'll find at least 2,000 golf, 2, of those golf courses have zoysia grass on them. Now, if you get into the north, you'll see some cool season grasses and whatnot. But for the most part, um, zoysia grass is the main uh, turf in Japan. As for greens, uh, Japan's kind of in a transitional zone type climate. So about 90% of the golf courses will have bent grass. And somewhere around 8% will have zoysia grass and the other being maybe some Bermuda grass, or there's a couple of golf courses that do have paspellum. Um, golf course maintenance in Japan, I mean, like any other country, you can find some really, really nice, well-maintained golf courses, and then others, not so. <clears throat> but for the most part, Japanese tend to keep a very nice, clean golf course. Another interesting thing in Japan, they have a two-green system at some of the golf courses. Now, in the past, years and years ago, uh, Japan being in the transition zone climate, they would have a summer green and a winter green. And so they would be a bent grass green and typically a zoysia grass green. In the recent years, um, I guess golfers preferred the bent grass to the zoysia grass. So a lot of those golf courses have changed those zoysia grass greens over to uh, bent grass. So then they have two bent grass greens. Now in this photo, this is taken from uh, Google Earth. You can see here, this is, this is the bent grass green. So, and some golf courses will, will call it a summer green and a winter green back in the past, but now it's more of like a main green or a sub green. And some of the golf courses, the members don't like to play on the sub green, so they call it the A, B, A green or the B green or vice versa. But you can see here, this is the main green basically right here. And then over here, they have the, uh, the Korai green. And so in, in the summertime, it's very difficult to grow bent grass in Japan. So 
they'll give the bent grass a break in the summertime and they'll play on the cori, or the, I'm sorry, the zoysia grass. And some of the holes, they'll actually even put trees in the middle to kind of separate the greens. And I've been to golf courses as well, so that they'll have a green way back over here to the right. So it could be a totally different direction as well. But I don't particularly like this system, but if there was one benefit that I could say I liked about it, is that when you're airifying or doing some kind of culture practices to this green, you can play on this green while this recovers, so you're not really affecting uh, play as much. And then vice versa, when you're doing things on this green, you, could, you can play on the bent grass. So in that aspect, maybe it's, it's kind of nice, but it's just another green you have to maintain, and it's another cost, I think, uh, added to the maintenance. So this is a video here. Japan, for some reason, uh, they think it's kind of a safety hazard to drive on the golf on the fairways, or they think it's going to hurt the turf. So you'll find this type of thing. It looks like this guy's going to get plowed with the golf the cart here. But he knows there's a, there's a track right there. If I can stop it. Yeah, perfect. There's, there's a track right here this golf cart is driving on. And they lock it into that track there, so you can't really get off track. Um, but, yeah, Japanese don't like carts in the fairways, so they put this system in so the golfers can just walk down the fairway and a cart goes beside them. So one guy has a remote control in his hand, and he's stopping and, and making the cart go. It's, uh, it's really interesting, and it it's kind of speeds up play so you're not going back and forth to the cart uh, to get your clubs or, or whatnot. But it's, it's, uh, it's another thing you'll find on lots of golf courses in Japan. A typical day of golf in Japan, um, so the golf courses are not normally in the city, so you're going to drive maybe 45 minutes to an hour to get to the golf club. So yeah, you'll get there maybe an hour early, uh, drink coffee, go hit some golf balls, and then you'll start your round. And so in Japan, you're, they start the players off on the on the front nine and the back nine every morning. So if you think about it maintenance wise, you need pretty much double the staff to get the course ready in the moment in the in the morning. So you need you need two or three guys on the front nine, two or three guys on the back nine mowing greens to keep in front of the golfers. So maintenance wise it, uh, I don't like it. I, I'd rather have just a one way start, but they they typically uh, all courses will do this two-way start. <clears throat> and then you play nine holes, and after nine holes, you'll stop for lunch. And it's another good revenue uh, aspect, I guess. They, they make you stop and, and eat in the restaurant, so the restaurant makes the money. But, and then after you eat lunch, which is about a 40-minute break or so, if, if the golf course is really busy, it could be an hour, hour, hour and 15 minutes. So you'll stop and eat lunch, and then after that, you'll go play another nine holes, and your day is finished, but then you go take a bath and maybe have a, a beer afterwards, and it's an all-day affair. So a lot of the, the players, they don't just show up to the golf course that day. They've, they've, they reserve their tee time way in advance, maybe a month or two months in advance. And so even if it rains, if it snows or whatever, they're coming to the golf course to play. So uh, that's... That's pretty much a typical day of golf in Japan, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's interesting, but it takes a, a full day. And at lunchtime, this is kind of what you're going to be, there's a pork cutlet uh, meal right there, or you can get some sashimi or, or whatever, and fill your belly up so you can go out and, and uh, play golf again. But if you're, in a, if you're having a good day of golf, it breaks your rhythm. If you're not having a good golf, maybe it's good to, to stop and, and take a break. The Japan Golf Tour has approximately 200 uh, members. Um, you'll see here I got, uh, I put, I asked what, how do you pronounce his name, but Mark Sang, uh, he's a Thai golfer on the, on the Japan Tour. He has won the Senior Open the past two years. I went and watched him last year, and he was 18 under after two days. So he's, he's, uh, he's pretty well known in Japan. And Krongpa, he, uh, he plays in our tournament. He's played there a few times. And last year, I think he shot seven or eight under. Those are two Thai golfers that uh, 
that you see normally on the, on the tour there. And some of the well-known players, Yoshikawa, he won our tournament two years ago. Uh, Shingo Katayama, uh, Yusaku Miyazato, and Yuta Ikeda. Y y Yuta has won our golf tournament uh, three times. So there's 24 tournaments on the tour and 15 challenge tournaments. Challenge tournaments are guys that have lost their seating and are trying to get back on the tournament. And so we, we also host a challenge tournament. And the challenge tournament, tournament that we host is in the end of June. And our main tournament is in the end of August. So we, every year we have two tournaments, which kind of causes the issue if you want to do some cultural practices or some renovations or, or whatnot. But uh, that's what we do, and I, I enjoy it. Uh, just to look on a map about how where the tournaments are located in Japan. Um, the pink here is the women's tournament. There are 35 women's events in Japan. Women's golf in Japan is really going through a boom right now. Um, a lot of the Koreans are pretty much taking over the tour because they're so good, but uh, women's golf is taking off. You'll see a lot of the tournaments are located in the big, around the bigger cities here, which is Tokyo, Nagoya, and Osaka. And then here we are down here, and so in the southern Kyushu Island there. So that's kind of the, what, what it looks like. This is Hokkaido up here, which has some really nice cool season golf courses. Uh, as far as money is concerned for the winners in Japan, this looks like a lot of money, uh, but it's equivalent to about $200,000 US dollars. So when it's not pocket change, but it, it, it's a lot of money, nothing compared to the PGA Tour. But uh, that's, that's normally, you'll, you'll find anywhere from 200,000 US to 400,000 US is normally the winner's prize uh, for the tournaments in Japan. <coughs> Kea is, uh, was established in 1964. It's located right on the ocean in Fukuoka. It's a sand-based golf course, so we have fairly have, we have good drainage, uh, but in the summer times it gets uh, droughty pretty quick, so that's a little bit of an issue. We, we have 45,000 rounds a year, which is quite a bit in Japan. Uh, our turf types, uh, greens, tees, and fairways are all zoysia matrella, and our roughs are zoysia japonica. This here is our maintenance team. Uh, it's consisted of 21 staff. Uh, there's 14 men and seven women. And the women will basically do a lot of the bunker raking, uh, flower beds, uh, ra raking leaves. Um, I guess a lot of the work that us men can't, won't, don't like to do or, or or whatnot, but uh, we also have summer part-time, six, about six summer part-time guys that come in and all they do is pretty much mow greens and do some cleanup work afterwards. And so th they'll work four hours a day from about May to October. <clears throat> so that's our staff. Uh, it, and in regards to Japan maintenance staff, it's, it's a pretty large staff. Uh, more, the golf course in Japan basically have 10 to 12 guys on their maintenance team. So our, our Zorge and Matrella in our fairways, it look, kind of looks like this, and the greens are, it's kind of more of a dwarf type Matrella where if you were to have both of these grasses growing side by side and just let them grow up, this would not grow as tall or as fast as the fairway type Zorge grass. In our roughs, we have zoysia japonica, which is a kind of a uh, more of a wider leaf blade type zoysia. Um, you could, there's golf courses that have this on their fairways and tees as well. So it could be mowed at fairway height, it could be mowed at tee height, or you could grow it up to rough. And it makes it makes a really nice rough because it's it's fairly easy to hit out of, even if it gets up to about 50 millimeters to 60 millimeters. 
If you get it up above that, then the golfers will start having trouble. But uh, it's a nice rough uh, and, and golfer friendly, I think. So Fukuoka is located here. So just in regards to Bangkok, we're, we're in the southern uh, island of Japan. And there's direct flights from Fukuoka to Bangkok. So everybody is very welcome to visit us anytime. Uh, we're, only, we're located about 45 minutes uh, from the airport, so very convenient. So we look forward to seeing you at KS sometime. Uh, rainfall we get, this is a, a, year, a yearly rainfall amount compared to Bangkok, and I was surprised at how m similar it is to Bangkok. We, we get, uh, this is over about a 10 year period of data, uh, but we get 1,775 millimeters per year, where Bangkok gets 1,768 millimeters per year. So I was, I was actually a little bit shocked to see, um, see that. Uh, we have our rainy season is typically from about the first week in June to the middle of July, and then it basically will just stop raining and it is very hot and humid. <coughs> um, as far as the temperature is concerned, in Fukuoka, I, I kind of left, we have four seasons in Japan. So we have summer, fall, winter, spring. And I, it, fall, winter, and spring doesn't concern you guys, so I kind of just left that off the chart. But there, there are periods where Fukuoka is actually hotter than Bangkok. Uh, during the summer, and I, I thought that was quite interesting as well. But um, so for today, we'll just talk about the summertime. And I don't really want to hit on on what we do in the off season uh, too much. <coughs> so in the fall, this is kind of what it looks like. You ha we have our japonica roughs here. It looks like it's overseeded with some cool season grasses, but it's not. This is zoysia grass teas. Uh, there's a first cut there, walkway, and then our fairways. And uh, so the, the roughs will go off color a little bit quicker than the uh, fairways and tees. And it gives a really nice contrast uh, in the fall. And in the wintertime, pretty much the, the entire golf course will go dormant. I would say uh, December, January, and February were totally brown. And we're just now starting to see some green up uh, in areas on the golf course. But so it's kind of prevent, uh, it presents us a few different challenges because we got 45,000 rounds and I would say 20, over 20,000 rounds are played when the grass is barely even growing. So the grass is just continually getting beat up over the winter time and can't recover. So you know, when spring comes, it's, it's pretty beat up. So, you know, we're trying to get, get some growth to, to help that recover. But um, I guess when summer hits, it, it all works itself out. <clears throat> but that's what it looks like in the summertime. And you see the greens here are, are a little bit green. And we'll paint those greens uh, two or three times during the wintertime just to give it some color. And I guess for the, so the golfers will know, you know, where the green is. So our tournament is KBC Augusta. It's uh, held at the, in the last week of August, which is the peak growing season. It's the hottest time of the year in Japan. Um, we've, we've had this, go this uh, tournament for 35 consecutive years. It, uh, before that, it was played on a different golf course in Fukuoka for 10 years. And KBC Augusta is, KBC is the Kyushu Broadcasting Company which is basically your radio station or the, the local TV station in, in our area. Augusta, I would like to say it is Augusta because it's held in August, but I have a feeling that somebody wanted to make it similar to a golf tournament in Augusta, Georgia, so they named it KBC Augusta. Uh, needless to say, 
we haven't made it that far yet, but uh, who knows. So our tournament has uh, 138 golfers uh, that, that play in it. Uh, we have, again, two-way starts in the morning. They start at 7.20. Uh, our sunrise at that time, I think you can start seeing a little bit around 5.40, 5.45. So it, it causes for a little bit of a, a panic in the morning trying to get everything done. But uh, yeah, they have, they put a lot of golfers in there. So, uh. <clears throat> so um, when I got to Kea, it was the first time I'd ever uh, ma maintained a tournament. So a lot of things are going through my head. And if uh, some of you guys already maintain tournaments, so you, you kind of know what, what happens. But if you haven't maintained a tournament and you might be having one, uh, just the, some things that might, be, might pop up in your head when you first have it, what do I need? Well, I can tell you two things that you're going to need. S tournament staff. Now, this is the US Open. I was uh, fortunate enough to volunteer at the US Open. And yeah, it's, it's a little bit overboard, uh, but it, it's, it's a major tournament, so, and that's how they do it. It's a lot of fun. There's a lot of networking that goes on. Um, and typically, you don't need this many people for a tournament. But if you have a major tournament, and you have some bad weather, or if something just doesn't go according to schedule, then you have the people in there to come together and, and get it done. So I would say there's probably 150 volunteers, and the rest are their, their own staff. Uh, same, I got to go to the Ryder Cup in 2016 at Hazeltine. Uh, again, just crazy amount of people. And, uh, but it's, it's fun. And I mean, you might have, I wanted to say four people stiffing greens, but actually it's like 16 people stiffing greens. You break up into these teams and you go stamp greens, you might have eight people cutting cups. Uh, but while you're doing that, you know, you're, you're networking with guys, and uh, you, there's a lot of learning that goes on uh, volunteering for tournaments. So if, if you have an opportunity to, to go volunteer for a tournament, I think it's a great experience. In Japan, it's like pulling teeth to get people to come vo help volunteer at our tournament. So I've, uh, I've done a lot of uh, calling up golf courses, local superintendents, to see if they can provide some help. And another tournament, Pebble Beach, the AT&T at Pebble Beach, uh, I went and volunteered here. This is more my style. It's kind of a really relaxed, laid back environment. Um, and I think we went and worked three days. But we'll have guys come to our tournament for like three days. Some, some guys come for one day. I really don't make them come for the entire week. I'm just happy to have them there. Uh, to be able to talk turf with them, what's going on at their golf course, and you know we learn from each other. So, uh, but you need staff to to make it happen, and your staff does all the work during the entire year. But to help you get it across the finish line, I think you should reach out to local golf courses to see if they can come help you uh, with your tournament. Another thing that you're going to need is equipment. Again, this is the US Open. You don't need this much equipment. This is more for show, uh, no doubt. And again, it's fun. It's really cool to look at, to see all that equipment going down the fairway, uh, all the greens mowers going every which way. But you know, just so you see this stuff on social media or, or wherever you see it, and don't think that you have to have all that kind of stuff to make the tournament happen. I think what you should do at your own golf course is get the right balance of staff and equipment. If you get too much equipment, your equipment manager is going to go nuts. So just get the right balance that, that'll, that'll carry you uh, through the tournament, and I think you'll, you'll be fine. So again, so we were, we've talked about what we need. The next thing is TV. Um, TV. The first thing that pops out, okay, what's it going to look like on TV? And it, it kind of gets you nervous because everybody's going to be looking at it. And if it looks good on TV, it's great marketing for your golf course. So you have to think about it, um, even if you don't really want to. So what I did when I first got to Kea, I 
I'd been to CAD during the term before, but I never really watched it on TV. So the first thing I did was get all the, the previous TV tournaments and just watched them over and over and over again, just so I could get a feel of what, what it looked like on TV, um, the problems that they might have had that, pr that particular year, uh, just so I could be ready for anything. And so I just took some snaps of the TV. Uh, so this right here, this is a flyover. When they introduce the hole during the tournament, they do a flyover, and they're saying, yeah, they've got to get over this bunker or whatever. And then you're like, what is this, and what is this, and is that a green, or is that a bunker? So obviously, there was not much communication going on with uh, the TV guys and the, the golf course or the maintenance staff. So it's really important that you know when those guys are coming, and either you plan your maintenance around them coming, or you have them plan around your maintenance. Because it's, I, to me, this is really important because it's on national TV. And so this is a top dressed green, top dressed green, um, obviously. So make sure you got some good communi communication going back and forth uh, between the TV crews, because this this happens maybe two or three weeks before. Um, the tournament. Another thing, I'm looking at this and I'm just saying this, this really just, it really pops out at me. It might not pop out to anybody else, but in the past, it seems like Kay has had a really hard time with like perimeter cuts and things like that. So I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, I don't want to call anybody out and I'm not doing this to, to, to make anybody look bad, but I just want them to be aware of what it looks like on TV, what they've done on, the, on, on their mowing, what it looks like on TV, and for them to be aware of it and try to improve on that every time they go out to mow and can concentrate. So it, again, you don't want to like call people out and make them look bad, but just make them aware of, of what their mowing practice look on TV. So this, I look at this and I'm thinking, okay, this rough is really ra ragged and rugged and it looks like it's all different types of heights and, and whatnot. And in the past, they didn't have the proper equipment to go out there and cut like before the tournament or whatnot. So basically, they just let it grow up. So I knew I had to, to figure out, okay, how am I gonna cut all the way up into the tournament? So you know, I, I got with the, uh, the management of the club and said, okay, we need to, to get this type of equipment and whatnot to, uh, to make the roughs look good and play like they should during the tournament. So you don't want grass laying over and going every which way. You want consistency throughout the entire rough as much as you can get. So that's another thing that did kind of popped out at me when I was watching. This is another issue that I've, I've kind of, when I went to K, I kind of saw it and it was stuck in my head. You see these lines in the green? You can obviously tell that's probably a mower setup issue or a quality of cut issue or something. Maybe they haven't ground the mowers enough. Maybe they, they didn't get properly backlapped, or I don't know. But I knew I needed to, to, to make sure this didn't happen. So I, I just kept that in the back of my mind and made proper adjustments uh, going up to the, leading up to the tournament to make sure we didn't have any of this uh, happen. <coughs> so right here, you can see it's getting droughty right here, right? And so I'm looking at this, and I'm thinking, okay, this is droughty, but this is kind of white, and I'm thinking this is not just drought. So I go to the golf course where this area is, and it's a lot. We have a lot of Bermuda grass contamination at our golf course, so the Bermuda grass in the summertime grows a lot faster than the zoysia grass, and is more easily to be scalped. <laughs> so I know that I'm going to have to to regulate the growth of the Bermuda grass so it doesn't grow fast enough to get scalped. And another thing is, maybe they try to lower their heights all of a sudden right before the tournament, so then you get this scalping on the Bermuda grass and not so much on the zoysia grass. So, so I know I want to start lowering my heights more and I want to regulate uh, the Bermuda grass so it doesn't get scalped. This picture here, uh, this is one of the, the signature holes here and I'm looking at it and I'm like, that's just that's just too much droughty areas for it to just to be normal. So I got to, you know, looking at the golf course when I got there and turning on heads and 
and I would say a third of the heads didn't even work on the golf course. So I knew immediately I needed to get out there and start at least getting some water coming out of those heads or I was going to be dealing with the same issues during our tournament. Because during the regular play, you can go out there and turn heads on and, and kind of manually and kind of keep everything green. But when the tournament starts, you can't just go out there and turn on heads all day. It's pretty much what it is is what it is. So a lot of things pop up during the tournament time that normally don't pop up during regular play. So looking at TV from the past tournaments is a really good uh, tool to uh, kind of prepare yourself for what might be coming up. <clears throat> so we've got what we need. We've got uh, TV. So you've got your tournament director's expectations. <clears throat> I can tell you right now the tournament directors, they don't want to be called out to the, well, the Japan tournament directors, they don't want to be called out to the golf course to make a ruling, and they don't want any complaints from the players. That's basically the main two things that they don't want. And I can agree with the, 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 the player complaints, but it's their job to go out there and make a ruling or whatnot. So I kind of like push that aside because I don't want player complaints anyway, but, uh, um, <clears throat> but that's another thing that, that's going to pop up are their expectations. Then you've got your sponsors' ex expectations. You know, they want a smooth running tournament. If you've got a heavy rainfall, they want it to get cleaned up, and they want play to resume as quickly as possible because they've got TV time, and they want uh, the sponsors to get their marketing on TV as well. So this is pretty big because that's if it wasn't for them, you're not going to have a tournament. So uh, I, I can remember my first year, 2013, I think we had over 500 millimeters of rain in that one week of the tournament. And the sponsors were on pins and needles wanting to get, I think you have to get 54 holes in to make it a complete tournament in Japan. So if it's not a complete tournament, it's just, it's, they have to return all the money back to all the sponsors. So um, they got their own expectations that, and you need to uh, be aware of those as well. <clears throat> Then you got the player expectations, which I think is, is the most important. Um, they're the ones out there playing, um, so uh, be aware of, and when I got there first, I didn't know what the players expected, and I'm still learning, but uh, you, know, you, you know they want fast greens and firm greens and whatnot, but uh, it's nice to, you have to keep those in mind as well, but in the end, you gotta, you know, after the tournament's over with, you gotta carry on your regular uh, play for the members or the outside guests. So you've got to do what's in the best interest of the club. Uh, so you don't want to push the, the grass over the edge and then you've got all these members and guests that want to come play after they see it on TV and it looks so nice and they come and say, whoa, what happened? Uh, and then it might hurt your uh, reputation down the road. So there's a fine line there, I think, uh, so you need to be careful with. Not to, not to go over the edge, but uh, so keep, keep your club in mind uh, when you're having a tournament. <clears throat> so when I got to Kea, you know, they've had this tournament for 35 years, and it got to be like a repetitive thing where it almost felt like it's just another day at work. I actually went to Kea before I, I started working there, and they didn't even have a morning meeting for the tournament. So I kind of knew that, that there needed to be some changes. So I got to the office, and, and it looks like this. It's really old. old, uh, old. It looked, it's more really gloomy, uh, dark. So I felt I needed to spice it up a little bit. So basically all we did was went and re-wallpapered it, uh, give it a little bit, little bit of a tournament course feel. Um, you know, get some more pride in, in the team uh, to uh, in the, not only the tournament, but just the maintenance uh, and everybody working for one goal. And then we started uh, getting, getting the flag signed and putting the, the our picture under the flags and whatnot, just to, just to you know, give the tournament the feel to the to the maintenance area. The shop was a disaster. I'm sure a lot of you've seen this, and it might even be at your golf course. But if you're there for so many years, it kind of just gets to be normal. But I guess go back to your golf course, take a look at it, and if it looks like this, maybe it's time to to organize things. If you're having the tournament, especially, 
uh, you need to be organized because if something pops up, you need to be able to, to know where everything is and be able to, uh, to make a fix pretty quick. So Kale was uh, pretty bad off when we first got there, but you know after but the first month we just we got we didn't leave the maintenance facility. We just cleaned it up, uh, got everything organized, and uh, it makes everything much more smoother operation. So during the off season, you know, we we got some uh, drainage issues around greens. Uh, that's where we concentrate, and also some landing areas. Uh, you want to make sure that those type of areas are, are free of water at, as quickly as possible after a big rain event. <clears throat> Bunkers. So we're a sand-based golf course, so you you won't find many catch basins in the fairways or the roughs. It's all just pretty much natural drainage. So we got. Oops, we got some bad draining bunkers here, so actually we just we dig and dig and dig until we reach sand, and then and fill it in with sand again, and just just to get the water going through there as quickly as possible. <clears throat> so I think in the when we were watching the previous tournaments, we saw uh, some some droughty areas. Well, after we started running the sprinklers in the summertime, my first year. I got to notice that these sprinklers are way over here in the rough, and we got a two-line system there. So this is kind of strange. We're not getting any water in the fairway here. So whoever wanted to water the trees, I don't know, but I got to thinking. So we got to make a change here. So in the winter time, we moved every sprinkler head into the fairway. It took three years. We did a, we did about six holes every year, and. Uh, it was a lot of work. The guys worked really hard, but now our our irrigation looks. It's a 40-year-old system. It's not the best. It's kind of like a band-aid over the situation, but we tried to make the best out of it. So, <clears throat> just because you you just because what's in the ground you think is, is supposed to be in the is in the right place, maybe it's not. Just kind of evaluate what's going on and uh, make adjustments. Uh, and this, those sprinklers had been like that for 40 years, and and it took that long to, to get them into the fairways where we needed the water. Because I don't really mind these areas right here being droughty, but it's hard to maintain a fairway when it stays droughty all the time. <clears throat> Another thing I noticed when I was first got to Kea was their nursery had seed heads popping up on some of the area and not on the other. So I'm I start asking, you know, what's going on here? And what they've done is they've started getting zoysia grass from different sod farms. And so basically it's it's kind of a mismatch of different zoysia grasses. And so that's I knew I wanted to kind of correct that. So we we start buying from the same supplier every year. And in Japan, there's no really branded turf grass there. It, if it's branded, it's more or less coming from from outside somewhere. So the brand is basically from the farm it comes from. And we get ours from Totori Turf, which has 220 hectares of sales each, uh, 200 hectares of, of grass, and 130 hectares of uh, sod. 40% of that is Japonica, 30% Matrella, 15% uh, for greens, and then they have another little, uh, they're branded turf that is more of a uh, residential type. But it's really interesting in Japan because we don't have much land, right? So there's 170 growers and they have all these little bitty plots of, it's like rice fields or whatever, of grass. It's really interesting. I had a chance to go visit them last year and it was just phenomenal the way they do it. So they have, so out of those 170 growers, they have 100, uh, 870 fields of, of turf that they take from. And so looking on Google Earth, th these are all little bitty uh, turf plots of, of, of where they cut, cut their grass. And maybe this, this is one supplier, and next to it could be a totally different supplier. So this supplier has this plot, maybe this plot, and that plot. And you can tell the big difference between each supplier, that you know, how much they keep it weed free or disease free or, or how much they fertilize or whatnot. There's a big difference in it. So it's good to go see where you're getting the grass from and uh, <clears throat> and see it in person. 
So I posted a video on social media and it got like over 35,000 views. I, so I thought I might just, this is how it's, this, it's taken in Japan here. So they cut it with a normal sod cutter. You got these old ladies stacking it up. <clears throat> and they come behind and bundle it up in these little ropes here. It's like an assembly line. It's And then they put it on a on a pallet on this tractor and take off. Now in the states, I don't I don't know how it's done in Thailand, but you get these big rolls, and I'm I'm in awe every time I see it because I would love to have something like that. Because when this comes to your golf course, this is what it looks like. It comes on these big trailers, and so we got all of our staff out there getting it off the trailer truck into our trucks. And then we've got to take it to the, to the course, then we've got to unload it, and then after you unload it, it looks like this on the, on the golf course, and so you've got to sod it with these little bitty pieces of, of square sod. <clears throat> now, so it leaves a lot of seams, it kind of makes the grow in a little bit longer than what you'd, you'd want, so, you know, in reality, I'd rather have big uh, rolls of sod, but anyway, this is how Grass is late in Japan, so if you've got a tournament, you need to think in advance if you're going to do any construction work or renovation to have time to grow in uh, those seams and whatnot. <coughs> but pretty interesting. Another thing that I try to cut down uh, or try to increase the effic efficiency on is before I got there, they, they got these pine trees, and in the pine trees, it's just, it's almost like a jungle. So they'd go out there and just be bush cutting pretty much continuously, and I, I thought, yeah, that's a waste of time, so on every hole, I went and marked an outline here, you can see, and we just rounded up everything inside the pine trees, and the first couple of years was tough because you have all the, a big seed bank, I guess, in the, in the pine trees where the, it's just continuously coming back and coming back, but after you do that, uh, and I know you guys don't have pine trees or whatever here, but you might have some areas where you can uh, do something like that to kind of increase the efficiency of maintenance on your golf course. But after about five years or so, it, it, it's, we've cut it in half, the, the applications that we have to make, and <clears throat> it's been a big key in, in, in helping us focus more on the playing areas, uh, tees, fairways, and greens. <clears throat> In Japan, so we, so we have a lot of Japanese black pines on our golf course, and this doesn't really concern you, but it's a deal that we have to, with something we have to deal with. So this is right before our tournament. I don't know how well you can see this, but this tree is just starting to turn a little bit yellow here. Uh, so I know I've got a problem, and it's on the 18th green. It's right in front of the scoreboard here. It's right where everybody's going to be looking. So they can actually come in and take a piece of limb and go uh, inspect it and, and find out if it has pine tree nematodes inside of it. So they did it, and if I wouldn't have cut that tree down, it would look like this in a matter of three or four days. It's so fast. Once it goes, it goes. And what those nematodes do is they go into the tree and they pretty much just clog up the inside where no water or nutrients can get up and down the tree and just cut that off, that nutrient supply and water supply off, and it just turns brown. And before I got to Kea, this is where we cut that tree down very carefully without uh, damaging the tent. Um, <clears throat> so before I got to Kea, they think they lost, well, actually I got there right when the peak of it was, but they lost like 5,000 trees uh, in a matter of three years due to these pine tree nematodes. So, we go through extensive preventative measures not to let this happen. And so this is drilling holes in the tree and injecting insecticide in the trees so these nematodes will, I guess, die before uh, they start causing problems with the tree. And this, uh, this type of application you normally lasts about five years, and then you'll have to do it again. So we're on a four-year plan to where we, we do all the trees that are 40 centimeters 
in diameter and above, um, and it's very costly. But uh, you know, it, I got to thinking that you can go out and resod turf anytime, but once you cut a tree down, it, it, it ain't coming back. So, uh, or it takes a long time for it to. So we 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 do lots of things like helicopter spraying. We do two applications with the helicopter. Um, <clears throat> they come in and spray all the trees uh, with this helicopter here. And the helicopter just gets the top of the tree. So after that, we have this jet engine sprayer that we take all over the course and we spray up into the trees here to, uh, to battle this. <clears throat> so that's just another uh, issue that we, we do. And, and during the winter time, we'll prune all the trees that are on the golf course, and you see this kind of got the nice Japanese style uh, tree pruning, which makes it look very nice on the course. <coughs> so uh, before the tournament, we have two inspections that the tournament directors come. So I thought it's just the tournament directors, but needless to say, there's quite a few people involved in this. So you've got the TV crew, you got all the sign staff, you got all the seating uh, and stadium seating staff that come in, all the sponsors, event coordinators, and you do this actually during play. Uh, so we're walking down the fairways uh, on our little tea time with about 30 people or so. And the first inspection is in May. And at that time, they're, they're kind of getting an idea of what they want to do for this year, if they want to change a par five to a par four, they want to change some fairway lines, um, things like that. Maybe they want to move a tee up or something. Uh, so that's in May, that's basically what they'll do. Uh, then they'll come back in August, and the August inspection is more of make sure there was no disasters over the summer that they got to, to worry about, uh, just to give them a heads up on anything that we've been doing over the summer. Um, and. Yeah, just give a good look over on the, on, the, on the course. So after you have these, the first inspection, I think it's a good, it's a good time to kind of get in your head about uh, what your targets for the tournament are going to be. Uh, obviously, speed on the greens. You know, what, what, do you, what do you have in mind for the speed? You want 10 feet, 11 feet, 12 feet? Um, and I think you've got a pretty good idea of what you can do and uh, what's practical or not. Uh, soil, mo soil moisture and firmness, um, we'll see later in some data, they kind of go together. So I think it's good to know um, if you got 18% soil mo moisture in your greens, what's your firmness going to be? If you got 14, what's your firmness going to be? Because it's bad to have them too soft, but they can also be too hard as well. So uh, just you need to kind of start getting an idea of where you want to be during the tournament week, I think. <clears throat> and then height of cuts. You don't want to all of a sudden get to, you know, two weeks before the tournament and say, okay, I want to drop the height a millimeter or three millimeters or whatever. You want to have in mind uh, your height of cuts so you can gradually start uh, increasing or decreasing those heights. <clears throat> so greens maintenance. Um, I like to kind of start about eight to ten weeks out, and and it's good when you're when you're planning your your maintenance for the tournament to to go backwards from the tournament date, right? So you're eight weeks out from the tournament, so that's when I, I start I start wanting to tune in uh, the maintenance uh, schedule or or get the big stuff out of the way, and then I can start detailing everything out from there. <clears throat> so. If you're going to do greens aeration, and I say if needed, uh, no later than, I say eight weeks before the tournament. Um, I'm kind of, this kind of goes along with what Bill was talking about this morning about growth management and whatnot. And I've started to, you know, aeration used to be for me like an annual event. You just do it because we've always done it. And I'm, I'm trying to, you know, change that, that uh, thinking so that you know, we're, we're managing the growth of grass, and if you manage it well enough, you're not producing so much organic matter to where you can kind of like get away from all this disturbance on the green surface and, and whatnot. But 
I'm not going to say you shouldn't verify because your every course is different, but I think it's something that you should really start looking at and uh, and deciding if if I'm just doing this as an event or if it's really needed or not. But for us, I don't want to anything inside eight weeks. I'm not going to even touch with verifying. So basically, I'm I, I, my my cut line is eight weeks before our tournament. Again, verticut and top dressing. Um, with this, with our new approach to the growth management, uh, I've, we've cut back a lot on our vertical cutting and top dressing. Um, but our cutoff line, basically, for vertical cutting and top dressing, is about five weeks before the tournament. And our grass is pretty dense and tight, so I don't do a lot of uh, light top dressing because it, it just doesn't work in very well. So I kind of like to open it up and get that top dressing in, in those openings and then uh, let it grow in after that. But for uh, the vertical cutting top dressing, so this is our top dresser machine here uh, making its application. And another thing is if you top dress too, too close to the tournament, um, there's a lot of things that can go wrong here. You, your quality of cut's going to not be as good. Um, the ball, if the, the sand is still there during the tournament, you're going to get uh, sand sticking to the ball. That might affect the ball roll. Um, another thing is you'll see if when the ball lands on the green, you'll see this big splash of sand or whatnot, and things like that you don't want. So you don't want to be top dressing too uh, close to the tournament. And after we top dress, we, we uh, this is a driving range mat, real fine uh, mat there that we just get in a cart and, and drag in the sand as good as possible uh, like that, and then, then water it in, and it's pretty much done. Uh, runners, we, we, we didn't have so many at the start of when I got to Kea, but over the years, we started getting these little bitty runners starting to develop in the green. And I want to say it's due to maybe plant growth regulators. I don't know. Maybe the grass is getting dense and the runners don't really have anywhere to go, so they kind of creep up on top of the surface. You know, I'm not sure, but we started getting an increase in that. So at first we were out there trying to hand pick these runners, uh, but it, it just got to be too much. So we got, and our verticutting units, they wouldn't really cut those runners because they were just lifting them up and then they'd go back down and reroute. And so we got this unit. This is, a, I think it's from True Surface. Uh, there's a, a, an attachment that goes to your, to your triplex. And those, these blades are kind of bent at an angle. And I guess that angle is just at the perfect uh, degree where it, it'll, it'll cut those runners really nice. You don't want to go too deep with this because it can really start ripping up the turf. But we go, we, we normally stay between uh, 0.25 millimeters to 0.5 millimeters, and we don't go any deeper than that. And we'll take this over the green maybe once a week uh, leading up to the tournament. We might uh, increase that to two times a week, but uh, two weeks before the tournament, we just cut it out and uh, let it go from there. <clears throat> but we don't use buckets. We just uh, let it go and, uh, and pick it up with the mowers after. I think it's a good time to take a break or keep going. We'll go a little bit more and then take a break. Um, greens mowing, we use a Shibara 22-inch uh, GEXE 22. Basically, we're mowing at 3 millimeters year-round. Unless we've got a tournament, uh, we'll drop it down. But uh, for the most part, uh, 3 millimeters. And this might seem like common sense but, or whatnot, but uh, we mow in a different direction every day. <clears throat> and before I got to Kea, they, they, they didn't pick which direction they mowed at, so uh, you never knew. Uh, so if you, if you don't pick the direction, most times the greens mower will go to the green and mow in the easiest direction possible. And you can start developing grain issues if you do that. So. I would set up a system where you're not mowing the greens in the same direction every day and kind of split that up. I've actually seen golf courses want to burn lines in the greens, and I don't understand that concept. 
um, because I want the grass uh, growing upright as much as possible. But uh, pick your directions. I think it's, it's important. Um, and as Bill was talking about this morning, you know, we, we record daily clippings every day, and I've been doing that for 17 years. The first 13 years, I didn't care what I was really getting. I just looked at the clippings and thought, wow, I got a lot this time. The grass is really healthy and growing, but now I'm kind of dialing it in and, and uh, managing the growth more, and we'll get into that later uh, in the presentation. But the reason I, bought, I, I went with this mower when I got the Kia, and some of the manufacturers might say I'm wrong, and I could be, but if you guys can see these, these little lines in the greens right here, that is not from a setting issue. Basically, basically, I guess my theory is the mower is set up at an aggressive angle. At such an aggressive angle, when the zoysia grass is standing straight up, it's really stiff. And when the mower cuts the grass and turns and goes back the other direction, it's overlapping. And that where it has already cut the grass, it's trying to cut it again, but it's already been cut. And it's not really getting a good cut on it. And it's making this white, these white streaks in the greens. And I've tried every mower, and it happened with pretty much every mower I, 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 I used. And even with this mower, so you got, you got three different settings. You got three different settings with this mower. You got uh, for, the, for the bed knife, and it's called the offset. So you're actually moving the bed knife forward and backward uh, for making it more aggressive or not as, not as an aggressive. So you got uh, six, a six millimeter offset, an eight millimeter offset, or a 10 millimeter offset. So even if we do this mower at a 10 millimeter offset, we get those streaks. But as we moved it back to six, you, would, you wouldn't believe the difference in the quality, I'm not, I won't say quality of cut, but uh, the decrease in those lines that, that showed up in the green. Also, it's kind of like uh, the further back you get, it, it acts more like a, a, in a sweeping action. So if you've top dressed recently, if it's in that sweeping action, you're picking up a lot of sand, right? But if you get down to the less aggressive angle, you're not picking up as much sand, it's, uh, and it's more easier on the, on the turf grass as well. So that's the reason that I chose this for our particular golf course, and nothing against the other manufacturers, but it's what's worked for us. As far as uh, brushing the greens, I like to get my mowers as compact as, as possible so we don't have any gouges in like the, the edges of the greens or, or in actually in the greens. So I try to make everything as compact. Um, there's actually like a groomer that can go in here and this front uh, roller will be out here. But uh, to get it compact, I took the groomer out uh, and we groom with those triplex groomers like I showed you earlier. And then there's a lot of people that put a brush out in front of the roller here, but I didn't want to brush the grass and have that front roller going over it and then cut. I wanted to have the brush somehow stuck in between the roller and where we cut. So as soon as we brush, we're cutting grass. And so our local distributor um, kind of modified a brush for us and so we'll use these uh, leading up to the tournament and throughout the year, but when the tournament starts, we've decided to take those brushes off because we were using the, these brushes for the PM mowing during our tournaments. And we found out that the green speeds were actually a lot, well not a lot, but they were faster before we cut the grass with the brush on the mower than they were after. So during the tournament, we just take them off and, uh, and go with no brushes. I think this might be a good stopping point uh, for our break. Uh, so maybe about a 15-minute coffee break. 
Maybe you guys can wake up and uh, we'll get back at it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, guys, uh, let's take a break. 15 minutes. It is uh, 2.05. Let's come back. What, 15 minutes for 2.20? Okay. Everybody's kind of getting sleepy, so get up around and uh, have some coffee, okay? 